You're watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And welcome back to the program, Dr. Trumbull. Now, Doctor, you're working in predictions for future experiments that we can use to study through gravitational waves, these these black holes, namely the um, the LISA and pulsar timing arrays. Can you tell us about those experiments and what we might learn from them? Yeah. Uh, so, so first I'll, I'll point out that the pulsar timing experiment is, is ongoing right now. So I, I guess I can start with that one. So, so yeah, I'll preface this with I'm not, I'm not an expert in, in these types of observations or in the instrumentation side of things. But from a basic level, what the pulsar timing is meant to do is detect gravitational waves from relative changes to the pulsars that we detect in around us in the Milky Way. So there's a, a bunch of satellite dishes that continuously observe a bunch of pulsars, and the numbers that they're observing are actually growing with time. And they, they look for variations in those pulsars that can be caused by a gravitational wave passing through them. So, well, just to step back for, for a little bit, right, for, for those that don't know, so gravitational waves are ripples through space-time. And the main effect that they have is that they sort of stretch and compress space-time very slightly. So the, the LIGO experiment, and what that's meant to detect is gravitational waves passing through the Earth, causing the two arms of LIGO. So LIGO has these two L-shaped arms that have lasers going through them, measuring the distance of those two arms. And when a gravitational wave passes through, the, the distance, the, the sizes of those arms slightly changes. And so that you can detect that through the laser interfering with itself differently as the it has to travel slightly different distances. And I believe like it's some fraction of a proton radius or something like that that is actually detecting that change. It's a very small change. And it's, it's important to measure this on very large distances. So LIGO has kilometer sized arms. So with pulsar timing, what you're doing is you're, you're letting your distance baseline get to be parsecs in size, light years in size, right? by looking at all these different pulsars going off and measuring essentially the, the relative change in them due to gravitational waves passing through. And so this is, this is really nice. It's, it's hard to do, and you're really sensitive to really the most massive black holes going through merger events. And so currently, for, for this, there hasn't been any detections of gravitational waves from this yet. But even with the non-detection, some interesting sort of upper limits have already been placed. And there's some interesting insight you can get into, you know, how how many massive black holes there must be in the, the relatively nearby universe. And so, yeah, this is this experiment is sensitive to, to the more massive black holes sort of that exist and they're going through mergers in the, the latter half, let's say, of the universe. So like black hole mergers that take place from sort of the, the middle of the universe's history to now involving the more massive black holes. And yet using this large, using the pulsars as kind of a, a baseline for detecting the, these ripples in space time. And as time goes on, the, the experiment is getting more and more sensitive because it has more and more pulsars. And of course, as time goes on, you're more and more likely to detect an event, right? So if you go only for a year, you're not likely to detect uh, one random event. But if you go for 10 years, you're 10 times more likely at a given rate to detect one, et cetera. So as, it, as, it, as time goes on, the constraints will be more and more interesting and hopefully they'll have some detections. Now the, the other experiments, LISA, that's in the future. So, so LISA should be launching in the early 2030s. And what that is, so LISA stands for the uh, hopefully I don't screw this up, uh, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. So what that does, this is much more similar to, to LIGO in design, right? Where instead of having kilometer-sized arms connected by lasers on the surface of the Earth, we have three separate spacecraft connected by lasers that are millions of miles apart. And they're sort of in this tumbling orbit actually around the sun so that they're in a trailing orbit around the earth is the plan and as they tumble around they'll be much more sensitive to gravitational waves 
Now, the, the thing to keep in mind with gravitational waves is that they, they're sort of like sound waves, right? So, so sound is also waves traveling through a medium. And, you know, just like in, in humans, right, our ears can detect sounds of certain frequencies, but not sounds of other frequencies, right? Like a dog whistle, for example. Oftentimes humans can't hear that, but, but a dog might be able to. So that how your ears are, are optimized depends on what wavelength of sound you can hear what frequency, more in particular, of sound you can hear. And the same is true for gravitational wave detectors. So LIGO is sensitive to a certain frequency of gravitational waves. And this frequency corresponds to merges of black holes that are like solar masses in size. So stellar mass black holes, like we call them. LISA, on the other hand, will be sensitive to different frequencies. And in particular, frequencies that are going to be common for binary supermassive black holes. So the same thing, same thing with the pulsar timing array. These, these two experiments are sensitive specifically to the frequencies that we think should exist for black hole mergers when the black holes are millions of solar masses or billions of solar masses in size. And so between these two experiments, we hope to, to detect, to build on the gravitational wave detections already done by LIGO, but for supermassive black holes. Uh, and LISA so is very complementary to, to the pulsar timing. So pulsar timing, like I said, is very sensitive to the more massive black holes and sort of closer by black holes. While LISA is going to be very sensitive to, uh, to, to lower mass black holes and will be able to detect mergers of these black holes all the way back to the very beginnings of the universe. So the very first black holes that form, supermassive black holes that, that, that will eventually grow up to be, you know, Sagittarius A star or the 10 to the 9 solar, the, the billion solar mass black holes that we're seeing in other galaxies. But these, these smaller black holes that, that have only just formed in the very early universe, that if they merge, LISA will be able to detect those. And so the thought is that LISA is going to play a really important role in studying the very early beginnings of black hole growth by looking at if it, if it does detect merges of black holes, looking at the, the masses of those mergers and how frequently they, they occur during its four year mission will tell us a lot about so the black hole demographics in the very early universe. How do and, and will help place constraints on how do black hole supermassive black holes begin their life and then how fast do they grow on average over time. Um, so it'll be really, really interesting to see. So you have very complementary science goals going on, which together will hopefully give us a better census overall of, of the black hole population in the universe. Right? Because you know, currently, for the most part, we can detect black holes pretty well nearby in galaxies. Um, and we can detect black holes further away. But really, the only way we can do that is if the black holes are growing very fast and are typically very massive. So we have a very biased view of the black hole population, the supermassive black hole population in the universe. We can only detect the ones that are growing very rapidly and typically are also the ones that are most massive. Um, but between between these two experiments, we'll get a better handle on maybe the, the population we're missing, the, the lower mass black holes very early on in the universe and the, the more massive black holes that are maybe more quiet and aren't growing so fast uh, later on in life. Um, and yeah, together combined with, with the detections we already have and improvements that we're making in how we're detecting black holes that, that are growing through, through light, we'll get a, a more complete picture of sort of the history of black holes in the universe over time. So it's, yeah, I think, I think it's all about unbiasing our view of black holes. Unbiasing. All right. Now, <laughs> would that, when you look at, a, at, at black hole mergers that early, you know, early in the uh, history of the universe. Does that give us any kind of a probe or anything that would reveal more information about the Big Bang or inflation or anything like that? Oh, that's that's a good that's a good question. Not quite. So so when I say early universe, so yeah, <laughs> if you're if you're like a, a cosmologist who cares about you know Big Bang nuclear synthesis or or inflation or something like that, you're talking about a time period much much earlier even than than this. In this case, we're talking about probably black holes that are forming and merging right around the same time that the very first stars are forming. So this is, you know, inflation's already happened, there's already been a lot of evolution, things that, all of that stuff have has already run its course 
and now galaxies are begin, be, beginning to emerge. Uh, and, and as the first stars are forming, we think also the first supermassive black holes, or what will become supermassive black holes, are forming. Uh, so yeah, not so much inflation, not so much the, the Big Bang science, but more so the evolution of galaxies, the evolution of black holes. You know, when a galaxy is forming, if it's forming with a black hole at its center, how is that affecting things? How fast is that black hole growing on average? How often is it going through a merger? Things like that can really help us understand and constrain some of the theoretical models like the ones I run for galaxy evolution, right? How much of the, the evolution, this, this co, what we call coeval growth between galaxies and black holes, as galaxies and black holes grow together in the universe, how much of that is dictated early on and, and how much of the galaxy's later evolution is sort of affected by these very early events of black holes growing. That's, that's very much an open question. We, we, cause since we can't see most of these black holes early on, we don't really know what are the signatures that they leave behind on the galaxy, what what effect these black holes have as the galaxy is first beginning to, to take shape. So, so all of that can really be begin to be addressed if we first you know actually have a more complete census of these black holes in the first place. Well, how many black holes, talking you know more about this other class of black holes that are you know stellar mass and so on, how many of those do you, do we think are present in a, in in the Milky Way? I mean, is it a common object or is it somewhat rare? It, it depends on which ones you're talking about. So there's so so for total black holes in general, probably something on the order of millions of black holes because they they come from massive stars which are relatively rare. But when you have you know ten billion stars, you have a lot of black holes. You have a lot of massive stars that come along with that that will that will form a black hole. So quite a lot. They're quite common, and we we detect a lot of them usually because they're interacting with nearby stars. Not not a tidal disruption event like we're talking about with the supermassive black holes, but more like they they form in a binary or they capture another star gravitationally, and the star is so close that that sort of more gradually feeds its mass to the black hole, and you get what's called an X-ray binary, where so that you have a black hole that's feeding on gas from another star slowly, and is bright in the x-rays as like a point source in the sky and we can often detect them that way so yeah there, there's there's quite a few now the one thing that LIGO really did that was interesting is it started detecting these very massive black holes not super massive but like dozens of solar masses you know 50 solar masses 40 solar masses and it, it's a puzzle and I, I think it's still contentious in the community as to how these black holes formed in the first place and why they go through mergers, why we're detecting them with, uh, with LIGO. Uh, so we didn't, we, there might be more of these very massive stellar mass black holes than we thought. So our idea of how the mass of these black holes is distributed might be different and is still a bit uncertain. Overall, they're still, you know, they're still quite common. Even if the more massive ones are a bit rare, more special, overall, stellar mass black holes are, are commonplace in galaxies. And my last question for you, Doctor, I know you're a fan of sci-fi and, um, and the genre. Um, what is your favorite black hole story? Oh, favorite black hole story. Oh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question. Um, I think, yeah, I can't pick a favorite <laughs> <laughs> well all right if we're talking about like physics wise well part physics wise i mean interstellar is really a cool movie with that respect only because uh so i have a lot of problems with interstellar uh in terms of the science in the movie and lots of people do um, as do we all <laughs> but the, the one really cool thing they did that was sort of not really done ever before was use science to uh, model what a black hole looks like with with gas around it. So, you know, it was for the first time, like the, the most amazing part about watching that movie was seeing a black hole. You know, I, it was a simulated image, but it was probably the closest that, that we've gotten to, you know, feeling like you're actually looking at a black hole, which was pretty awesome. Um, even though even that simulation has some problems to it. So, uh, there's there's actually a few better, I believe, simulations, more accurate simulations of what what the light around a black hole would look like. 
because you have like you have photons that are basically orbiting around the black hole, which is kind of crazy to think about. But it just the the distribution of light. There's lots of physics in there, and so that they, they didn't quite actually include all the physics in the movie. But but even so, that was that's probably the one of the more memorable things involving a black hole in like a, a popular movie. I would say. Yeah, I, as I recall, they you 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 should see one side of the black hole differently than the other because light's being shifted differently. I remember years ago, there was a astrophysicist, a French astrophysicist, I think, that tried to come up with a diagram of what a black hole would look like. I think Lumine, maybe? Um, that you would see one side of it, you know, slightly darker than the other side of it, and they didn't do that in Interstellar, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, but fundamentally, they got closest, at least. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so actually, you know, if you look at the the image produced by the Event Horizon Telescope, right? That, that does have that, right? You have that sort of unequal light around the black hole, that sort of beaming effect that, that you get. And the simulations they used to, to understand that observation did include all that physics. And yeah, so that, yeah, it is important to include, but still, you know, there's, there's other uh, really cool visualizations online from other groups that are technically more accurate, but, you know, seeing it in a movie for the first time, you know, that was pretty magical. And then, of course, you know, with my friends arguing about the physics for, you know, <laughs> a couple hours afterwards, that was fun, too. But the seeing the black hole, quote unquote, seeing the black hole is uh, pretty cool. Although now we have the Event Horizon Telescope, so I guess we can see them in real life now, which is pretty awesome. It is. And I actually talked to a member of the team on the Event Horizon Telescope, and they were talking about that very variability, that fast, short term variability that black holes show that uh, we were talking about earlier and we can actually see that now and this is kind of crazy if you think about it <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh really cool looking forward to them making more detections yeah exciting time that was a bit of material that went over the edge a bonus clip from a full episode of event horizon new episodes every thursday so do be sure to hit subscribe the full episode should be on your screen right about now.